Welcome, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us tonight for What Does Racial Diversity Look Like in a Race-Specific Organization? A conversation with Shade Lipcott, Jeffrey Udin, and Natalia Vieira, moderated by Rebecca Kelly G. This program is presented in partnership between the Shelley and Donald Rubin Foundation and the Asian American Arts Alliance, a 2020 art and social justice grantee of the Rubin Foundation. A few points of introduction. My name is Sarah Reisman. I'm the executive and artistic director of the Shelley and Donald Rubin Foundation based in New York City, where we've supported art and social justice through grant making for the last 25 years. And since 2015 at the eighth floor, where we've been organizing exhibitions and public programs that address themes of social justice and political import. Before we begin, please note that this event has closed captioning as well as ASL interpretation. Instructions are in the chat section, but I'll note that for those who would like to access closed captioning, when the captioner starts writing, the CC button appears for viewers. Typically this will be visible at the bottom of your Zoom pane. Viewers can then click on subtitles next to the CC button to show captioning and then choose show full transcript to have the full transcript appear on the side of the screen. For ASL interpretation, just note when we're screen sharing, please click on Brendan or Andrea's box and click on the three dots in the corner, then select pin video. In the meantime, if you can all set your sound to mute, I think you're all probably muted. Uh, we will open the conversation to questions towards the end. At that point, we ask that you use the chat function, function to submit your query, and then you'll be called on and unmuted. If you prefer to have your question read for you by one of us, just make a note alongside your question in the chat. Also note this event is being recorded and will be available early next week. So I'd like to take a few minutes for a land recognition to acknowledge our respective relationships to place. We're gathered virtually in many locations at once. Some of us are in Manhattan, others are in other boroughs of New York City that are mostly, if not all, unceded lands. As this event is co-organized by the Rubin Foundation and the Asian American Arts Alliance, I'll address the specific sites where our offices are located near Union Square and in Dumbo, Brooklyn, respectively, as well as other boroughs where many of you may be, therefore acknowledging the Muncie Lenape, Canarsie, Matinecock, and Wappinger communities, past and present, as well as future generations. The Shelley and Donald Rubin Foundation on the eighth floor acknowledge being founded upon exclusions and erasures of indigenous peoples, including those whose land is where our places of work are located. This acknowledgement verbalizes a commitment to pr a process of working to dismantle the ongoing legacies of settler colonialism, a commitment that has become all the more poignant in this time of political upheaval and resistance that has resulted in transformative activist engagement across the country. I'm going to add to this land acknowledgement a virtual land recognition using language devised by Jill Carter, a professor in the Indigenous Studies and the Drama, Theater and Performance Studies departments at the University of Toronto. Carter writes, quote, Zoom has erected its headquarters in San Jose, California, while Skype has erected one key arm of its operations in Palo Alto, California. This is a traditional territory of the Mukwekma Olone tribal nation. Current members of this nation are direct descendants of the many missionized tribal groups from across the region. We, are who, we who are able to connect with each other via Zoom or Skype are deeply indebted to the Mukwekma Olone people as the lands and waters they continue to steward now support the people, pipelines, and technologies that carry our breaths, images, and words across vast distances to others. Thank you. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Lisa Gold, who's a longtime friend and colleague, and since I think 2018, the Executive Director of the Asian American Arts Alliance, heretofore referred to as A4. Within the Rubin Foundation's last cycle of grant making, A4 proposed a three-part series of programs to address racism that occurs within culturally specific communities. Having participated in trainings like Race Forward's Racial Equity in the Arts Innovation Labs and Americans for the Arts National Arts Service Organization's working group, some participants affiliated with A4 had found that these workshops tended to be centered on white leadership, confronting their own unconscious biases and address racism in the field. Um, and then, uh, or to consider how people of color can confront white supremacy. But these types of workshops generally historically have not addressed the racism that can take place within and between specific communities of color. Um, considering where we are in the year of the global pandemic, most of the Rubin Foundation's grantees were encouraged to adapt their original proposals in order to meet more emergent needs. 
after conversations with Lisa, um, we decided to organize a virtual series relating to the questions raised by A4's project proposal. And here we are in our first session moderated by equity and justice consultant, Rebecca Kelly G. Seeing as we have a lot to cover, I'd like, I, I hope you'll join me in welcoming Asian American Arts Alliance and our panelists. Welcome, Lisa. Thank you, Sarah. Um, and thank you to the Ribbon Foundation and William and George for giving us um, the opportunity to present this series. Um, I'm Lisa Gold, the executive director and a quick accessibility check. I am a, <clears throat> excuse me, I am a Hapa woman, um, half Korean, half white with dark brown shoulder length hair wearing a black sweater. And I am speaking from um, the unceded Lenape and Canarsie lands on the Lower East Side of Manhattan. Um, for, for those of you who are not familiar with A4, um, we are a 37-year-old nonprofit service organization dedicated to ensuring greater representation, equity, and opportunities for Asian American artists and arts organizations. Um, we offer events that build our community, such as a bi-monthly town hall and monthly um, Asian American Pacific Islander arts leaders calls. Uh, we provide professional development programs and access to cultural gatekeepers um, through career roundtables and, and other workshops. And we try to uh, create a platform to discuss issues related to Asian American identity um, through our conversations series, of which this is an example. Um, I, I have to say, I'm, I'm really, really excited uh, to be presenting this uh, Reimagining Diversity series. And I'm just gonna add a little bit to um, the thought, the genesis behind this idea, um, adding on to what Sarah had mentioned. So about a year and a half ago, um, the A4 team, we found ourselves Sarah said, discussing this issue of um, bias within our own community. And we thought that there was really a lack of, um, a lack of conversation, um, a lack of dialogue around it, and that um, all of this discussion, all of this talk of, of racial equity and DEI focus was really seemingly about um, diversifying white-centered spaces and addressing diversity and equity and justice from a white perspective. And so as Sarah noted, we, we proposed this idea um, to the foundation and really wanted to bring together Asian Americans and other BIPOC artists. I don't even wanna get into the term BIPOC. I'm not gonna get into the language right now. <laughs> um, but uh, so we wanted to bring together organizations so that we could actually um, you know, discuss these, these thorny issues and try to build um, mutual understanding and real allyship. And then COVID hit. Um, and then the, just this, the brutal, brutal murder of George Floyd, which was so painful on so many levels. And in the wake of that, um, that unjust killing and the uprisings that followed, um, we found that many, many Asian Americans came together um, to support members of the black and brown communities in the streets and through social media. But um, we, I, we could not escape the fact that one of the officers involved in that killing was an Asian American. And it just reaffirmed the need to have a space to talk about difficult issues within and among our communities. And so I'm really, um, I'm so grateful, like I said, that we can come together and hope that we can, you know, begin to, um, you know, support each other through these really challenging and uncomfortable conversations. And I'm so um, grateful to the incredibly, um, thoughtful uh, people, participants, <laughs> panelists that we have joining us tonight who um, are actually doing the hard work to achieving equity rather than just this kind of performative idea of diversity that we're fed through, you know, ads of smiling couples at barbecues and <laughs> things like that. So um, I'm really excited to hear from our speakers tonight and I'm very, very excited to hear from the audience and I know that there's a lot to discuss. And so I hope that these panels will lead to more conversations and real coalition building. Um, and just one more thing before I introduce tonight's panelists, I, I wanna let you know that we're gonna be sending out a survey as well as um, dropping the link to the survey in the chat. So please, um, please respond and help us understand what you'd like to discuss further or learn about or take action on or objections to what's been discussed tonight. We wanna to hear it all, the good, the bad, the ugly. Um, so thank you um, for your participation too. 
And now, um, with great pleasure and gratitude, I'd like to introduce tonight's panelist. Um, first off, uh, Shade Lithcott is a Harlem native and serves as the Chief Executive Officer of the Historic National Black Theater, the nation's first revenue generating black arts complex and the longest run theater by a woman, a woman of color. And she's also the chair of the Coalition of Theaters of Color. Um, she also leads Culture at Three, which is a daily call that brings together more than 300 cultural leaders from across New York City. Um, she serves on that uh, or leads the reopening working group. Um, and in her spare time, she wrote and produced a musical and she sits on the National Board of Advisors for Art in a Changing America. I do not know how you sleep, Shade. Um, next is uh, Jeffreen Eden. Uh, Udin, excuse me. Jeffreen is the executive director of the Asian American Writers Workshop. Uh, Jeffreen is the first woman to lead the organization since its founding in 1991. Uh, she came to the workshop from PEN America, where she served as deputy director of development for special events. And before that, she helped oversee executive education at New York University's uh, Stern School of Business. Um, she actually began her career with um, a stint at the Brennan Center for Justice at NYU School of Law, where she helped create the infrastructure for public programming and spent nearly three years managing an online book salon for Asian media. Uh, and there's so much more to, <laughs> to say about all of these panelists, so I'm gonna try to speed through this, but not too fast to um, upset uh, Andrea and the amazing signers here. Um, next, Natalia uh, Vieira Salgado was born in San Juan, Puerto Rico, and is and she has worked as a curator, a researcher, and curatorial consultant in both Puerto Rico and New York City. Uh, in 2017, she founded uh, Publica Espacio Cultural, an independent art space in her hometown that aims to provide a platform for local and international artists. Um, previously, she worked at a number of institutions, um, both in Puerto Rico and in New York. Um, she received a Andrew Mellon Foundation grant as part of um, a residency program uh, in partnership with um, Abrams Art Center and Publica Espacio. And she has an MA in curatorial practice from SVA New York and is a founding member of Colectivo Se Habla Español, which is a collective that develops artistic and social, and social projects, excuse me. And she is currently the assistant curator of visual arts at the America Society in New York. And Last but not least, of course, is our moderator, the amazing Rebecca Kelly G. She is an equity and justice facilitator, an interdisciplinary artist, and a former civil rights attorney. Um, as a founder of her own practice, Rebecca Kelly G Consulting, her work centers around people um, in creative communities to help them separate themselves from socially prescribed identities, decolonize the imagination, generate collective growth and move culture and institutional practices toward equity. She is an accomplished writer, speaker, and has received numerous honors. She has degrees from the University of Connecticut School of Law and um, Wagner College. So now I turn it over to uh, Rebecca Kelly G. Thank you, Lisa. Um, hello, everyone. Welcome again to the conversation tonight. Welcome to our panelists and welcome to everyone who's joining us. Um, I, I won't say too much more about what's grounding us here because you've heard that, but I was very excited to receive this invitation to hold space for this conversation because it is so crucially important that we as BIPOC people have time together to sustain challenge uh, and affirm our own practices in a way that is not centering whiteness. So I'm very much looking forward to doing that tonight and talking to this dynamic panel. Um, before we do that, we're gonna lay the foundation with a series of community agreements. And those agreements are gonna guide the way that we interact, all of us together, the way that we interact 
as panelists and with me as a moderator. And when you all enter into the chat or enter Q&A, these are gonna be some guiding principles for us. Um, William, can you bring up the agreements for us? Thank you. Okay. So the first agreement is um, one mic. This is very easy over a webinar. It's just one person speaking at a time and making sure that we're giving everyone space to um, complete their thought. The next one. Move up for the collective, take space, make space. So this is an acknowledgement that there is collective wisdom that all of us bring wisdom into the room and that any system or structure that we're talking about lives and manifests within us um, as well as the tools for liberation. So we wanna make sure that we make the space for all of us to contribute in a way that suits us. So if you are a person who um, it's very easy for you to hop in the chat and you have things that you want to, to say when you're unmuted, making that space and, and, and doing that, but while recognizing that you want to be um, creating space and time for other people to share their wisdom as well. And if you're someone who it's a struggle for you maybe, to um, get in the chat or to say something, recognizing that what you have to say and what your experiences are have value. So to try to, for the betterment of the collective of the whole, um, share, share your perspective and ask your question. Next one. Because none of us know everything, but together we know a lot. That's just something we can all try to sit with and recognize. The next one, William. Based on my knowledge and experience. So when we're all speaking, that is what we're speaking from. That is our own limitation and that is the beauty of our experiences is that we're speaking from our knowledge and from our experience. Um, and if you are taking issue with, with something that someone is saying, recognizing that that's where they're speaking from and that's where you're speaking from. And if you can do that, then maybe that's where the gap is. I um, mean, it can support your conversation. Next one. We acknowledge that we carry both privilege and oppression. All of us, um, we need to hold and honor that reality that we carry both the privilege and oppression within us and it's relative to the situation and the circumstances that we're in. So please try to do that and carry the multitude of your identity, both with humility, but also with pride. The next thing, we can't always be articulate, we can speak in drafts, especially when things are like, really popping off, you might have something that you're very excited to say, and it's okay if you don't have it said or done perfectly. That's true for the panelists, that's true for all of you. Um, just let what it is that you have to say move through you, and we're all gonna make space and allow that to come through as it comes through, rather than trying to do it perfectly. Um, next one. No intentional infliction of pain. As we do speak and we do uh, put our points forward, we might cause pain if we say something that is contrary to someone else's experience or someone else's knowledge, it might cause pain, but we're not gonna do that intentionally. The next one. But should we say something that does cause pain, what we're gonna do in this space is honor the impact of our statement over the intent. We might have a positive intent, but what has happened, what we need to hold is the impact of what we do. Next one. Wait, my favorite, why am I talking? <laughs> um, it really is my favorite because it's just about intentionality and being deliberate. So when we're speaking, if we wanna do all these things that I've already listed, it takes being deliberate. Why am I speaking? What is it I want to con contribute right now? Is it because um, this is a question I'm really sitting with? This is a point I think really needs to be made or am I trying to demonstrate my knowledge? We don't need to demonstrate that. Everyone here has wisdom. We all are gonna honor that. We all acknowledge that. Let's be deliberate um, with moving our conversation forward when it is that we choose to speak in this space. Next one. And first listen to understand and then respond. As we're listening to one another, making sure that what we're doing is really listening to what the person is saying and trying to understand what they're saying rather than thinking to ourselves about how we're gonna respond. We've never heard whatever this person is saying before. We've never been in this moment before. So if we really want to be able to respond, we have to listen. Next one. And to the extent that discomfort comes up within you, um, we wanna respond to that with curiosity. And that response is internal. You're feeling discomfort. Ask yourself, why is that? Is it because of what was said or what was said bring up something in you that you need to investigate for yourself? Or is it something that needs to be investigated as a whole? 
I think there may be one more, William, or is that the last one? Okay, that's the last one. Thank you so much for running through those. Um, so we're all gonna try to honor and hold that as we go into our conversation, which we are getting into. <laughs> We've all been eager to, and now, now is the time. Okay, so so first, um, as we said, we're, we're talking, we're getting into what are our strategies? How do we connect together um, as, as BIPOC people, as artists, as organizers? And so this first question, um, I'm going to, it's open to all the panelists, but we're gonna start with um, you, Jeff Rain, to give your feedback on this, which is what are some um, examples that you have that you can share with us around challenges and successes of movement building and um, creating work around race and ethnicity with other BIPOC partners. Thank you so much, Rebecca. And um, thank you, Lisa A4 and the Shelley and Donald Rubin Foundation for hosting this important conversation. Um, I'll start with, uh, I'll, I'll, we launched a new editorial project in July um, in response to the uprising and reckoning that the country was having around racial justice. Um, and we have an online magazine at the Asian American Writers Workshop called The Margins. And we launched a new editorial project called Black and Asian Feminist Solidarities. It's a monthly, um, month. we publish monthly and it's a collaboration between the Asian American Feminist Collective and the Black Women Radicals, two amazing feminist collectives who are really just embodying the spirit of doing the work and they do the work in so many amazing ways. And we have um, become this new editorial home where they publish every month a new installment. Um, it's a project we're really proud of and that I think has been a really good example of success in the work that you just described um, for a couple of reasons. I think first, um, we've envisioned it as a long-term project from the get-go. We didn't want it to be a one and done type of thing. We've mapped it out to take place over at least the next two years, if not longer, because we recognize that these conversations can't be fleeting. It can't be something we talk about now because it's on people's minds and then forget about. We want it to be a long lasting, sustainable um, act of solidarity and allyship. I think also there's a lot of people working on this. It's not just one group. It's not just one community. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a diverse kitchen of cooks. And um, and we've done that intentionally because we we don't want it to be kind of one group dictating what this approach looks like. Um, our goal with the project is to use feminist histories and frameworks from both the Black and Asian communities um, to help us come up with tools and strategies that um, help us build toward collective liberation. Um, and so the third way that I find it uh, particularly successful is um, we're honoring our histories and not just our history as an Asian American community, but the black feminist history, uh, histories of their community. It's just, it's honoring all of our individual histories and seeing how we can use them to come together and move forward. So that's an example of, um, of success. I'll say in terms of challenges, I think um, the most striking challenge to me is just showing up for other groups and showing up for other communities. It's very easy to, to say you're an ally or to you know promote allyship with your words, but how are we actually doing it with our actions? Um, even something as simple as attending each other's events. You know, are we actually showing up physically um, in this year virtually for other communities? And um, I do think this year, one thing that I've noticed personally is um, a rise in coalitions. I think um, the need to connect with other groups has really um, brought out a lot of, a lot of new coalitions have popped up, you know, primarily because we weren't able to gather in person and this seemed like one way to connect with other people and other groups. But I think also um, groups are recognizing there is power in numbers and there is power when we, when we work together. And, um, the Asian American Writers Workshop is a part of a number of coalitions, but there are so many that are that are popping up, and I think it's evidence of um, 
people recognizing that we do need to work together. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that, Jeffrey. Yeah, and, and what you one of the things that you you mentioned in there um, was allyship and you know what that means. And I know we talked a little bit about that in preparation. So Natalia, I know that you'd mentioned um, having some strong thoughts and feelings around allyship and what that means institutionally, what it means interpersonally. Um, so I just wanted to turn to you and see if you had anything to add about successes and challenges that also can speak a little bit to that, to allyship. Sure, thank you. And thank you all for, for having me. Um, yeah, so I think that we should, I mean, the, the word ally, uh, I, I find it that we need to start kind of deconstructing what it means. Um, also thinking about what does it mean to have solidarity within an, an arts organization um, and thinking about how these organizations um, managed what happened with, you know, the, the Black Lives Matter um, movement and also followed that by the pandemic, you know. Um, I, you know, I think that we should start with the people who you work with um, and how these institutions operate. Um, I also feel that all of these words have lost their meanings because we've been using them so much for, for our own programming. And, you know, we, we love to say, uh, you know, that we are building structures of solidarity, but are we really doing that with our institutions? Um, are we laying off our staff? You know, how are we being more um, productive? Um, are we um, supporting mothers? You know, all of these things are uh, just uh, adding up. And I, I don't know, I would love to see allyship expand and not just having this common goal, uh, but just feeling, you, you know, just finding ways in which we could uh, find unity and commitment towards a better, you know, being a better person towards each other. Like, uh, so um, I don't know, I think I we should start looking at our own, like within ourselves um, in the institutions that we, that we want to build. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I'm hearing you say that we need to have more uh, similar to what you were saying as well, Jeffrey, and like more action behind these words that it's coming almost to be a little bit robotic, solidarity, liberation, allyship, diversity, what do these things mean and what do they look like in practice? Um, Shade, I'd love to turn to you and see you know, if you have anything to add in terms of examples of that that you've seen, putting those things into practice. Um, and then I and then I'd love to hear from each of you as far as like your personal definitions of of solidarity and what that means. So yeah, Shade. Oh, uh, I echo what everyone said. Deep gratitude to be here tonight. Um, thank you, Lisa. Who I feel like it's so funny living in this virtual world. Um, so many people are on culture at three. I created talk about coalition building and like sisters and brothers through this crazy virtual reality. So lovely to convene with everyone tonight. Um, thank you for having me. Um, a couple of things. I think that when we talk about um, challenges and opportunities in cross-cultural um, partnership, I really, you know, a really wonderful model of both the challenges and the opportunities is the Coalition of Theaters of Color. So I chair coalitions of theaters of color. It is one of the largest coalitions of BIPOC theaters in the country. Um, and we have 52 cultural arts organization under the umbrella of coalitions of theaters of color. Every, everyone from Amarinda, one of the only uh, Native American theater companies in the country to Pregones and National Black Theater, Pan-Asian Rep. And those meetings are incredible. They're incredible because there is a sense of solidarity. We have all come together to have a unified voice around equity, around justice, around looking at the city's budget from a space of radical uh, recentering of um, 
values and principles that New York purports to be, right? Where equity is only as, um, as, as useful as its actionability or its, um, its, uh, uh, its implementation. And as a group, we are a powerful force, right? As a group, you know, in the hardest budget of the, probably of many people's lifetime in New York City, CTC did not get cut because we all came together um, to advocate for each other's survival and not just our survival, but holding New York City's administration's feet to the fire of what this city purports to be. On the other hand, the meetings can have so much infighting because there's so many assumptions that are made cross-culturally, right? And, and you know, the old adage, when you make an assumption, you can make an ass out of yourself. And that constantly happens. And I think it's something that Jeffreen was saying, right? We're, and uh, Natalia, we're all using the same language, but we are all also defining things differently. And I think that we have to have super clarity when it comes to what we mean when we say equity, what we mean when we say diversity, you know? Um, and so that is what I'm very interested in because not all things are laid plain the same. And so I think that it's important to deeply listen to the concerns of each community, but also within our own community, deep listening in terms of the intersectionality of our experience to paint a more vibrant, accurate, radically just portrait of how we can come together. Because if equity means different things to different people, if justice means different things to different people, we can't have the same conversation, even though we think we are having it. So that's kind of my experience of um, kind of the opportunities and some of the challenges. And I think that solidarity is extended to that, that that principle, the value of deep listening, right? That's also for me, the root of allyship. How can I be an ally to any other community within within other communities or myself, if I'm not deeply listening to the needs of them, right? There's a reason why grassroots organizing is the most sustainable organizing because it comes from the bottom up. And I think that's where solidarity comes from. That's where allyship comes from, deeply listening to the needs of others and showing up, if only to hold space and wait to hear what are actionable steps that support whatever the, um, the intention or the action that's wanting to have happen. So that's kind of my take or approach on it, the whole thing. <laughs> Yeah, thank you for that. That makes a lot of sense. And, and it makes me think about, I mean, you were using this term radical, everyone has been sprinkling that in there. And, and I believe it's Angela Davis who says radical is simply grabbing something at the root rather than staying up here, really doing this deep listening and connecting with one another and connecting with ourselves, both in looking at you know all of the things that we bring that are wonderful, but where are our own limitations? Because we all we all have them. And in order to really listen and connect with each other, we have to, to reckon with that. Because um, as you said, coalitions are always going to be powerful, but can we really build together? Can it actually be um, a gear or a motor that fits together? Uh, so um, let's go back to Jaffrey, just to this definition of solidarity, what it looks like in action, what these things look like in action. I think, you know, when I think about defining solidarity or allyship, um, to me, it ultimately always goes back to relationship building, like true, genuine relationship building. We're all people. Um, and remembering that, um, you know, Shade mentioned really deeply listening. I think that's a huge part of it. Um, and I think a piece of it and a part of listening is also knowing when others need to be heard instead of you and when you need to step back. So I think about, you know, after the murder of George Floyd, institutionally at the Asian American Writers Workshop, you know, we were thinking about, you know, what do we do? How do we respond? How do we, you know, demonstrate solidarity? Um, but also we recognized this was not our space to take. This was, you know, we needed, we wanted to amplify 
the voices of the organizers on the ground. Um, the the grassroots and community organizers really doing the work and, and starting a lot of these these protests. So, you know, we did release a statement, but it was very, it was very short. It was very kind of to the point. It said Black Lives Matter. And then we directed people exactly to where to give money and where to follow and how to support people on the ground. So I think an important part of allyship um, and part of that deep listening is knowing your place and knowing when to step back. Um, and having kind of the self-awareness to do that. Thank you, yeah. Natalia? You're muted. Sorry. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm gonna echo everyone's comments. Um, and for me, I feel that it's, it's, uh, it's hard, you know, I've been only working here for five years and uh, even though, you know, our relationship, I'm Puerto Rican, the relationship to the U.S. is kind of complicated. Um, and I've been working in different museums and institutions. Um, I feel that the conversation was like different here and there. So like we, I had to kind of see what was happening, what was going on, why people were having these conversations or not. Um, so, you know, something that I did uh, with a colleague um, that, you know, I felt was uh, an act of solidarity was, you know, to, to write a statement and a letter um, and to have a bunch of people sign it. And we had over 3,000 uh, co-signers and you know I went to uh, all these news outlets and uh, but what do what do we do with that you know and honestly it has been really intense trying to balance <laughs> my new job and um, so I feel that you know that was my way of showing up but then we are trying to build um, you know, principles of unity and seeing how we can all come together. We don't even know each other, you know. Uh, we met through Zoom meetings and uh, we're trying to to be more, uh, you know, to come together and how do we do that? Well, it's a conversation that we are still having, um, but we are meeting, um, I haven't been able to attend all the meetings, but uh, we're doing, you know, the work. Uh, but what does it mean, you know? And to be in a position of power also, and, you know, to be able to, to have all these experiences as a person um, that I don't, I can't inhabit that, you know, experience because it's just, it, it's not me, uh, but how can I do it from my, my own experience and my, my privilege, you know. Um, so that's uh, that's how can I can I I still feel that I'm not we're not there. Um, <laughs> so uh, yeah, it's a it's a constant conversation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I appreciate you mentioning your own privilege and privileges and the ways that that exists when we are trying to movement build. Um, you know going back again, right, we're, there's always a lot of power in our coalition building and we are pushing, pushing to make sure that there's a recognition that none of us are a monolith and that's accurate, that is true. Um, and, and Sade, you, you also mentioned though, what can happen in the spaces, and I think Jeffrey, you were saying this too, are the assumptions that can come up within, within our groups about uh, ourselves, about, each other. And that's something that I found too in cross-cultural organizing uh, or work. There's this, you know, we're not a monolith, which is just and right. We're not a monolith. And then the, when we get into the work, sometimes there can be like a resistance or a fear in acknowledging the ways that we are in fact different, the divergences that we have, the privileges and oppression, um, you know, things like colorism or immigration status or access to education, those things, um, they can be real minefields when we're trying to build together and there can be a real discomfort and a desire to kind of push past. Um, so I'd love to hear from, from each of you around how you have been working with that, how you've been confronting 
and acknowledging and holding our intersectional experiences so that we can have real solidarity. I mean, to the extent that you're still working it out, I'd love to hear more about that too, but I, I saw you shut it unmute, so. <laughs> well, <laughs> I, I love this conversation. I love that it is a conversation, you know? I, you know, what keeps coming to my mind is all of the unconscious bias, right? This, this desire, like, that so many of our tools are the are, are the tools of colonialism, right? The compete, the compare, the top to the bottom. You know, we compare our experiences from a space of oppression, like there's the oppression <laughs> Olympics and like black people get the gold medal. No, indigenous people, you know, it's like there's so, but what we're doing is we're using the colonizers um, tools by which to try to build towards our liberation, which is impossible. I always say, you know, even in, uh, um, or, or community organizing, so much of, of the activism we see today is reactionary. And when you're reacting to something, you're centering the thing, right? You're giving energy, you're birthing the importance of the structure by which you're trying to dismantle. And those movement in that direction is a movement away from the from the the ancestral wisdom the uniqueness of why we are who we are right and so i think about audrey lord's quote you know the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. And so that's how I think about these things. I know in the work that National Black Theater does, we, you know, the foundation, the building blocks is that the white gaze doesn't exist. And that is, that is the way we approach how we navigate all aspects of the work that we do. And I think that not enough acknowledgement, and that's why this panel I, I wanted to say yes to felt so special, because what we're saying is that the white gaze isn't, isn't necessary, urgent, or has any agency in the conversation that we want to have, which is about sustainable action and sustainable change, not incremental. Because I think so many of us are fed off of the crumbs of you know, this other table. And we call that like belly fill change. And it isn't. Incremental change has happened since the beginning of time. Sustainable change has yet to happen. And so I think that, um, you know, having the conversation about like the root of our tools by which we seek liberation is important to have and acknowledging are to, to, to one of our community agreements, are all of our privilege where it exists and our oppression and saying that is a part of what makes our story unique. And that is a tool by which we can use to dismantle systems of oppression because it comes from our lived experience and not the monolith of the perception. And the last thing I'll say very quickly is that the intersectionality of who and how we are is how we get to where we want to go. You know, um, it, it, that's how we go far by acknowledging the value of the collectivity of each of our um, seats at a very intersectional table. It all has value. It's all important. Um, yeah, so that's kind of how I think about that. <laughs> yeah, thank you for that. Jeffrey and Natalia, anything you wanna, you wanna hop in there with? Um, I think everything has been, yeah, said. Uh, there's, you said it beautifully <laughs> today. Jeffrey? Yeah, no, I mean, I'll just add, I, I want to emphasize, you know, what Sade mentioned about how we end up centering the colonizer. I think even, you know, when we talk about decolonizing, that's still making the colonizer the, you know, your central kind of thing that you're reacting to. So, um, you know, I, I, the and we've talked a little bit about this, this, this issue of what happens when communities of color get umbrellaed under a monolith and what does that do? And I always think about, the sum of many parts being greater than the whole. And I think there are moments where the whole is important, especially in cross-cultural organizing, but um, 
you know, in individually with each community, I think it's also just really important. Um, we need to honor the, the diversity of our own community. I mean, for the Asian American community, for example, it's impossible for us to consider Asian American as an umbrella, right? We can't do that without contending with Islamophobia, caste discrimination, um, so many issues that are so specific to our community alone. So it's almost like there's two parallel tracks of what are we doing to effectively organize with other communities, but also how are we dealing with challenges that are unique um, to our own regional communities and our, our, our own um, divisions and diversities. Yeah, yeah, and, and it's, it's interesting. Both and is always the, the thing, right? <laughs> and it's, um, you know, without centering whiteness, without centering colonization, I do think there's a conversation that needs to be had about healing from those things because those are very psychic, spiritual, practical wounds that sit with people, that sit with communities in different ways um, throughout time and in different times. So, I would love to hear, it, it would be really useful, I think, to hear from you all about what are some practices or ways that we can or that you do center healing and connecting um, with yourselves, with your line, with your ancestral connection, and so that we can make our organizing more robust and from a place of wholeness, because I think sometimes centering, the centering of colonization, the centering of whiteness, a lot of that can come from the fact that there are open wounds that have yet to really be healed. And so you're leading with that wound. So yeah, uh, it'd be great to hear some, some reflection from you all on, on how, if you're currently practicing that, what are ways that you are building that into your practice as a community space, as an art space, um, or if there's things you'd like to see or that you've seen in other places sharing that too. And Natalia, I see you unmuted, so I'll go to you. Um, I don't know. I mean, for me, it also goes back to solidarity. Like, you know, are you being nice to people? Like, are you saying how are you in your emails, in your conversations? Like the state of the, you know, taking care of the state of mental health right now, which is, you know, incredibly like, a, an issue um, globally, you know? Um, I think that we need to be, you know, I, I go back to solidarity because it's just like, I think we need to take care of ourselves. Um, also with this world that we live in, especially in the arts, which is like, basically it's motor, it's like capitalism. We need to go back to, to see like, how are we operating in this system and how are we contributing also? So um, I don't know, it's just, I've been taking time, um, trying not to be, you know, distracted and taking care of myself, but um, others too, you know, in the way that I communicate, that's, it's very simple, but it's just, you know, being nice to each other. Um, yeah. yeah. That's simple but, but powerful because you're talking about dropping into your humanity and not doing like process and outcome over or product and outcome over process. Shade, I need to cut you off. No, I, I think that that's really beautiful. And just to add on to that, I would say that, um, you know, MBT was founded by my mother in 1968 mm -hmm. for the purpose of creating safe, sacred, um, space where Black folks could feel safe, seen, and sacred. And I think the sacred is a big part of the healing, um, that when we are able to tell our stories unapologetically, that there is healing in that. Um, and that is where, you know, that's the heart of the intersectionality and the nuance. I think that a lot of justice work is not sustainable without comprehensive um, conversations and actionable steps towards healing and healing from the inside out. 
that there needs to be carved out space, holy space, space that is held for our deep healing that goes seven generations back and projects seven generations into the future. And I think the challenge there is in, in Black communities, from my own perspective, my own lived experience, really sits at the heart of like this Tony K. Bambara um, quote that I love from Salt Eaters, where she asks the question, sweetheart, are you willing to be well? You know, like that quote gets me every single time because that is the question for communities of color. It says, are you, are you sure sweetheart that you wanna be well? Just so you're sure sweetheart and ready to be healed because wholeness is no trifling matter. A lot of weight when you're well. So much of our storytelling is told in proximity to the struggle and the fight. I dare, you know, Black folks to define or to tell their story outside of the lens of the struggle, outside of the lens of how we've been painted. You know, the, the what lives, the PTSD that lives in our DNA, this post-traumatic slave syndrome, Outside of that, who are you? Are you? Can you hold the weight of being well? And so that is the question we're always asking at National Black Theater. We're holding space. We're holding the weight of wanting that for our community. Part of our practice, just like outside of the esoteric stuff that I'm talking about is, you know, we have this um, practice called holistic producing. And what that looks like is we invest in contemporary black playwrights who we don't ask them to be politically motivated. We just ask them to tell a story that we will produce and tease out a social justice or social impact story. Um, theme within their script and we blow that up into a dramaturgical lobby exhibit because we know that the stories of our humanity that are played out on those stages play out in our lives and how can we build real sustainable bridges of understanding one another's stories. So we blow that up into a dramaturgical lobby exhibit and within every lobby exhibit you know, I, my hobby is to create altars because I understand the power of built space to hold space for our own healing. And so subversively, as you're learning about something, there is an altar that's holding us, holding space for our experience, our pain, our joy, our aspiration. And so you go from our lobby exhibit into seeing the play. And after every show, this is the holistic part of our pedagogy, is we have a post-show discussion where we ask the audience to relate their experience of what they felt in the lobby to the work. We hand over the art to the community to make something new and ephemeral in the moment because we believe that art is powerful not from the space of product or transaction but from transformation. And so I truly believe that that is the way forward. Healing has to be baked into every single thing that we do and it has to start with looking within ourselves and to, and to really audit where that pain is and not suppress it, but honor it. Set a seat at the table for it because it's a part of how we get free. Um, so that's how I think about it. Um, and it's essential and it's the work of communities of color to do is the healing work. The dismantling will come after, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, thank you for that. Thank you for that. Jeffreen? Yeah, I'll just add, um, I think Shade mentioned, you know, not considering and really removing the white gaze. And I think there's something just truly so cathartic in that alone. Um, and, you know, a couple of different things. And I think it, it also connects to what Natalia was mentioning about recognizing our humanity and coming from a place of, of hope um, and joy, really. I think about um, a film that recently came out, uh, Minari, which is about a Korean family um, who moves to rural Arkansas. 
and I had the opportunity to view a screening of it. And it's this beautiful film about this Korean family trying to, you know, have success with a farm in rural Arkansas. And there's no major storyline related to racism or racist Southerners or stereotypes that we might, you know, assume. Instead, the focus is on this family, the relationships of the family. Um, and there was a post-screening discussion with the writer and director. And, you know, he, he said it was an intentional choice. He didn't want his characters to be defined by their oppression. Um, and I just thought that was so beautiful. And there's such hope in that form of storytelling. And I think it's such a courageous form of storytelling. Um, at the Asian American Writers Workshop, we really embrace that. And I think we try to do that specifically by creating spaces for as many cross-cultural connections as possible because the Asian American community is so diverse and so um, wide ranging. So, you know, an example is we actually recently published a selection of works connected to the idea of land and Asian Americans relationships with land. And it's a cluster of seven pieces in our online magazine. And it includes work um, that talks about land reform in North Korea or um, a Filipino recipe and um, traditional food in, in the Philippines. And um, it's this beautiful selection of work that makes these transnational connections between so many Asian countries and the white gaze is not a part of it. It doesn't need to be. There's so much beauty and there's so much joy in our histories, in our traditions um, and being able to celebrate that and find connections within our community, I think is a really powerful form of healing in itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I appreciate all of that. You talking so much about centering joy and putting that into the art making and we, we haven't dug into that, I don't think enough. So I appreciate you really uplifting that right now, just like the process of art making and what is going on the stage. I um, mean, you were mentioning that also, should I like what is on what is on the stage or what is being written and what's being produced. What are your thoughts on how specifically our art making, our creativity, our imagination can be used as a tool for liberation and transformation socially for us as groups of color? And that's just to everyone, whoever wants to take that. It's what we all do. I know we have some thoughts about it. Rebecca Kelly G, can you repeat the question uh, in our art making? Yeah, in our art making, what power do you see in art making as a tool for liberation and social transformation. How does that support us as a community in moving towards those goals? And I can say, you know, where does that root come from for me? I think, um, and I say this frequently, you know, you, you can't teach what you don't know. It's hard for people to be what they can't see. In what ways are we, um, helping to create a landscape of possibility and, and of joy, of unapologetic um, acknowledgement through our art. What are the ways that you all are doing that? And how can you, you know, show all the people who are, who are sitting with us now, offer some tools or tips for how people can, can do that for themselves in their art making or in their community practice using creativity, using art. I would just say for, just quickly, tell the truth tell the truth of who you are, tell the truth of your experience, not, and, and that can be hard because so much of our experience is layered by other people's experience of us. It's hard as a woman, it's hard as a person of color, um, it's hard in spaces where you're constantly erased and it's hard in spaces that were created for you where you don't see yourself. And so I go back to this idea of the audit, right? The audit of what is important to you, what is uniquely you and write it. I promise you, the thing about art that is catalytic, the thing about art that shifts and changes culture is that we have a superpower that we don't 
half the time value because it comes so freely. I think that's why we're stumped with this question, right? And that is this unapologetic, clear view of the complexity of our own humanity set you know, set outside of our bodies as an offering for the world. And it is an invitation when art is honest, it is an invitation to others to have that same relationship with themselves, to ask those questions, to interrogate in that way. It is an opportunity that didn't exist the beat before you were laid wide open by experiencing someone else's piece of art. And so that's what I would say is this idea of extreme, I won't use radical again, extreme honesty and truth. The reconciliation that needs to be done with your own self, with your own family to be courageous enough to tell that story because that story is both powerful, it is both medicine, and it is both a weapon to create a pathway towards your own liberation, which gives community, which gives family the permission to be audacious enough to dream up their own liberation. And so I would say we do that through all of our programs at National Black Theater, and we hold space for community to come into relationship with that part of their own experience. Mm -hmm. Ashe, awesome. so, because what you're saying too, it, it touches on what Natalia, you were mentioning about um, productivity and tapping into your humanity and just being relational with yourself and with other people. I hear that Shade, and when, in what you say when you're talking about um, being honest, letting that come out and flow, being truthful and how that you're saying, I'm stumping you with that question because the ease with which that can happen. I mean, it's a per, it can be personally trying, but the ease and the healing that can come with that type of expression um, feels good. And then it doesn't feel necessarily like work. Like this isn't social justice work. This isn't social change work. This is fun and this is free and this is playful and this is tapping into all of these different things within and, my country. Yeah, and people of color in this country don't really have an experience of their identity not tied to labor. Mm -hmm. So if it doesn't feel laborious, if it doesn't feel, the exercise doesn't feel valuable to the outside weight, we don't qualify it as important. And so divesting personally from our attachment to our labor in order to matter mm -hmm. is the healing work, mm -hmm. is critical to having these pathways where we can have real sustainable conversation about what liberation and healing and um, joy really looks like. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, existing in that as you said, unapologetically. Um, Natalia, I just wanted to come back to you because I felt like those were so linked to see if you had anything you wanted to add to that. Yeah, no, and uh, I would add that, you know, it's our responsibility, um, you know, as curators to 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 allow space for those voices, you know? Something that I, that I always talk about when uh, people ask me, what do you do? Uh, what made you become a curator? You know, it's allowing space for for a story to be told and not necessarily, you know, talking about, you know, the state of arts, contemporary art or whatever. Um, Cause usually the art that I curate is mostly social justice, environmental justice, you know, and there's no excuse <laughs> for us to be excluding those voices because they are out there. And for me, um, you know, when I, when I listen to people talk about, oh, there was not enough people of color and, you know, that's your responsibility as a curator, as a, also, you know, as a professor, as an educator, as a, you know, it's, 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 you are in a position of power. So you have to embrace that and you have to take that as a, as a, as a blessing, but also as a responsibility. And some, you know, in some of these places, I was the only, you know, 
obviously I'm not a person of you know color, but I was the only person of color, quote unquote. And that was very problematic. So I feel that I carry a lot of responsibility. Um, and I see that, you know, we we are the ones that need to keep this moving and it's very exhausting, but you know, it's it's your job, it's your responsibility. I don't know. I feel that it's my responsibility. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We all have personal power and power comes with responsibility. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Daphreen, anything you want to add? I'll just add, you know, I think the power of the arts is even looking beyond our, our individual communities and, and, and our, our, the liberation of our communities, you know, artists are the emissaries of our times, right? And so when we think about for our community liberation, telling our story, art making has to be a part of it. There's no question about that. And I think embracing that and embracing storytelling, embracing creative endeavors as part of our liberation, it's, you know, it's not a matter of should you, it's a matter of, of course, you know, you have like, there's no question the it's intrinsically linked. Um, so I'll just add that to. Mm -hmm. And adding that with um, that quote that always gets me to that Shade was mentioning, it's, will you allow yourself to, I think, of course, and are you gonna allow yourself right. to be open with that creativity and to let those things come through you, let your stories come through you. Um, thank you all so much for this conversation. It's been so robust and fruitful and it's not done. <laughs> We're just gonna open it and move things on um, to the Q&A and see what, what everyone else has to say and how they wanna weigh in, which I'm very eager to do. And just wanna remind everyone as we do that um, about our community agreements and how we're gonna honor space. Um, we're not gonna pull them back up. I'm just gonna drop that back into your, into your mind. Um, so Lisa, I think I'm turning it to you. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Thank you all for that conversation. That was amazing. Um, so I'm gonna ask anybody who would like to ask a question to please uh, just type it into the chat box and I will um, attempt to answer your questions in order. And I may group some together just so that we can get to as many as possible. Um, the first question, oh, and I will ask you to unmute yourself. So um, I believe the first question was by uh, Stephanie, I'm sorry, Sally Lee. Sally, do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? Hi, thank you. Yes. Um, so there's been like a lot of discussion like on Code Switch, that podcast um, about the term BIPOC being problematic and being a homogeneous and overall umbrella term. But on the other hand, like I know it comes from this place of solidarity and it kind of seemed like over the internet and social media too, it just like came out of nowhere um, one day. And so um, some say, you know, it, rep it means black indigenous and people of color and others have been saying black indigenous people of color. And I was just wondering what are y'all's interpretation of that term? And like, do we need to, to like dissect these things in terms of how we have dialogue with each other about race? Thank you. I'll just, I'll say that I think the tension with the term is it's not unlike the tension that we were talking about earlier about the monolith versus the individual communities. It's it's that same challenge of, um, you know, when is it necessary or effective to be considered a monolith versus when do you embrace, you know, the individual nuances of your own particular community. So when I think about, you know, I I don't I don't know if I would go as I, I understand the problematic aspects of it, but I think the root of a lot of that tension is um, when are we a monolith and when do we embrace our, our individual kind of community characteristics? I feel like I'm, I'm like, like a quote person today, which is not my thing, um, but there's like the old adage, um, if you want to go 
fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. It's kind of how I feel about BIPOC. You know, it's like, I understand rooted, the rooted problematic aspects of kind of building an umbrella of monolith. And yet there is a lot of solidarity in both our privilege and oppression. And if we want to go far, there is a value of going together. And I see that as that. I see it as decentering some of the colonial things that we were talking about from the perspective, because I know it has that in it, but from the perspective of compete and compare, we're all in the oppression Olympics. And so if their struggle is perceived more than, you know, like, can we say as people of color in our very, to Jeffreen's point, our, our nuanced particular intersexual way that there is work to be done and we can maybe perhaps go further together. And so I look at it from that perspective. And I also, you know, there's this term that I use all the time It's called goal jacked. I think some of the interrogating of terms till there is no life left in any and all of us deter us and are goal jacking us from getting the bag or getting whatever the perceived bag is. So if we can like dead that noise to go together in certain aspects, that makes sense. Um, not across the board, not in a broad swath. I think it's important. Um, and, you know, we will nuance our language way out of being able to um, progress in lots of different ways. So. I always like to separate like the noise of things um, that stop us from progress. Uh, yeah. And I just wanna add, I mean, what a place of privilege to be able to have an argument about a term, you know, like <laughs> there are bigger fights to be fought everybody. And I think we also, as people of color, we can walk and chew gum at the same time. So it is possible to, um, cross-culturally organized and be considered this monolithic community and also embrace very specific nuances of, of the community that you are personally from. I, one doesn't exclude the other. And I think sometimes um, the discussion of terms and the discussion of these labels gets so flattened that people forget there is nuance and we can do multiple things at the same time. Slide, do you have anything to add or should we hop on to the next question? We do not have another question yet, believe it or not. Well, can I say one thing? I, this is such an inspiring conversation because one of the things that I'm very interested in is failing up. Um, I think that as people of color, uh, we are always, I shouldn't broadly stroke us, but so much of our experience for, from my perspective has, you know, you have to be twice as good to get half as much. And baked into so much of our ideals of success is that we have to be perfect. Like the road forward has to be paved, you know, say the right thing, you know, uh, uh, dress the right way, show up in a certain kind of way. And that I think to the heart of what this conversation wants to be hinders us from having cross-cultural, cross-racial, um, more, more partnerships like that because we're so afraid to fail up or to offend or not get it right or stuck in an old story. And I think in the ways that we're courageous in our own spaces, we need to be courageous and take risks in terms of our partnership across our collective experience as like marginalized communities in this country. Um, and I'm very interested in how the panel feels about when you look at partnership, especially from organizations and communities outside of your own, what is the criteria by which, you know, it is acceptable to come together? 
Are there barriers of entrance? And are we allowed to fail up in our attempt to come together? You know, I think that's, it's such an interesting point. And when I think about um, something that we talked about earlier in terms of challenges and successes in cross-cultural organizing, um, there's just such a need, I think, to partner with other groups and communities of color. And I feel like when organizations, arts organizations, organizations that are race specific look to partnerships, a lot of times we look to the big institutional ones, the white centered ones. Those are, you know, we consider those really successful partnerships and they are in a, in a huge, I mean, there is power in taking our art and our work on that mainstream stage. But I think we also need to be a little bit more introspective and, and ask ourselves like, why aren't we trying to have these same types of partnerships with each other? And why aren't we, viewing, you know, as, as a literary organization, you know, a partnership with a group like Cave Canem needs to be as valuable as a partnership with the New York Public Library. And too often, one will be kind of preferred over the other. Um, we all know which one. And we just need to ask ourselves, why are we, you know, why do we do this to ourselves? And I think um, it's something that we think about a lot at the workshop and something we definitely aspire to be better at. Um, but I feel like the field as a whole could certainly benefit from that. Yeah, and I just, I wanted to go back <laughs> to the BIPOC term just to, to both and this conversation, not to double down on it. You know, I, I didn't create it and it's not my, I'm not saying this is what we should use. It is the best or POC because I really jive with what everyone's saying about belaboring the terms and that not being, um, the work and that we can walk and chew gum. And also I think BIPOC is, what I see in that is an attempt to reckon with the differences that we have and our intersectionality and the various ways that we do move through the world. Um, an acknowledgement of color, I think it's an attempt at the acknowledgement of colorism, the acknowledgement of anti-blackness, the acknowledgement that um, the sentiment, um, you know, we are all immigrants is a beautiful sentiment, but is not accurate for everyone. Not everyone is an immigrant. So I think it's like the, the attempt, I think, to hold all of those things is what is there. Um, but yeah, we don't need to be the laboring and having that be what the work is. But, but I do wanna point to and acknowledge the importance of our differences and trying to make sure that we're centering that as a tool of solidarity, as a tool of self-perfection, not as a tool of division, like celebrating and honoring what makes us different and letting that be a part of how we move forward. Um, Lisa. Thank you. Yes, um, the next question is from uh, Lily Philpot. Um, Lily asked a joyful question. Lily, would you like to ask your question directly? Um, yes, can you hear me? Yes. Is that working? Um, so I just, I loved hearing and I always love hearing um, people just speak about the importance, the vitality of creating works that are joyful, especially in the BIPOC community. And I just wanted to ask if each of you could name, you know, a work of art that has brought you some joy, if you could recommend um, a piece of theater, a book, a poem, um, a movie, an album, etc. Thank you. I can talk about a project that um, I'm working with uh, in collaboration with the Abrams Art Center as part of my uh, residency. Uh, tomorrow, actually, uh, we are gonna launch uh, a compilation of music that we have from one of our residents uh, that I selected. And this was the first person that I, you know, have, I hadn't worked with music before, but uh, we we decided that we would do, well, she decided that she would do this compilation that's called Fiebre de Cabina, Cabin Fever. And it's, uh, you know, just a bunch of artists um, from Latin America, the Caribbean and its diasporas, uh, kind of looking at music as a way of, you know, making space for joy uh, in a time like this. Um, 
another project, uh, but this is maybe uh, too soon to talk about it, but uh, it's gonna be in the summer uh, with an artist, uh, Edra Soto, and she also works with this environments and she works with music installations and um, yeah, her, she likes creating spaces for joy as well. So that's my experience. Um, I'll mention two things. I, I did mention Minari earlier, the film, which I encourage, um, it's releasing next year. So I encourage everyone to see it when it when it does release. But two, um, two things that have been giving me kind of personal joy. Um, Amy Nezdukumatatil's book of essays that was released this fall called World of Wonders. Um, I encourage everyone to read it. I've been every time anybody asks me what my favorite book this fall was, I, I say that book because it's this beautiful book um, talking about her experience growing up as a South Asian girl, but it also mixes nature essays and essays about the world around us. And it's this beautiful meditation on the relationship between um, her experiences as a South Asian woman and nature. And you don't hear about brown people in the outdoors. It's just like not something that is talked about a lot. There's this, going back to stereotypes, there's a stereotype of, you know, we don't engage with the outdoors in that way. And her book really flips that on its head in a really beautiful, heartwarming and funny way. So I encourage everybody to read that. Um, and then I'll also mention just personally, um, Anik Khan is a rapper, musician, uh, uh, born and brought up in Queens, not born in Queens, born in Bangladesh. Um, and his work is just so joyful. It embraces, you know, his identity as somebody brought up in Queens and, and kind of the local nuances that come with that, but also his Bangladeshi heritage. And it's also just really wonderful music. So, um, it, it's such a beautiful celebration of his identity and the complexities that come with it. Um, I'll drop both of these names in the chat and encourage everybody to take a look. Great, thank you. Um, we had two questions about funding, but um, I am going to defer those because the third panel in the series is just is about that um who is diversity for and it talks about yes these um oppression olympics and hunger games of funding and what can we do differently and that is going to feature um panelists from the new york community trust um nathan cummings foundation uh the arab american national museum and um andy from uh Naini chen dance company so i'm going to move on, I encourage you to join us on January 14th for that panel. Um, but I'm gonna pose this, Brian Tate had an interesting uh, question. Brian, do you wanna ask your question? Yeah, thank you, Lisa. And uh, what a great panel. Thank you and Sarah for presenting this and respect to the panelists. Um, my question was, how do you engage with people in your community who disagree with the principles of solidarity, uh, those who support racists in elected office, for example, despite their visibly racist policies and rhetoric. Um, can I, please, I wanna just quickly answer the last question um, for Lily and I will tackle Brian's question from my perspective, but um, Toshi Regan's Parable of the Sower is an incredible piece of work. Um, and I recommend if you can see it when it comes to town or if there's a recording of it. Um, I am obsessed with Adrienne Marie Brown's body of work, but Pleasure Activism is an incredible book that brings me such deep joy. And then there's a, um, an audio visual installation piece by Arthur Jaffa called Love is the Message, The Message is Death. It's a seven minute video that is just all things to me and brings me quite a lot of joy. Um, so hopefully that's helpful. Uh, Brian, your question. Um, you know, I, I approach that like, what's for me? <laughs> Not all things are for me, for my energy, 
for my, you know, what is noise versus what is news? What is for me? And, and what is like clickbait? So a lot of the noise is not for me and we don't engage. Um, I think that not, my no or my lack of engagement is as powerful, if not more than my yes. And so I curate my no's as meticulously as I curate my yeses. And so I, a lot of these conversations aren't, aren't productive to me. And so I don't deal. I will say there was an interesting, really challenging experience that we had at MBT almost 10 years ago um, and not around politics per se, but you know, a part of NBT's mission is that we subsidize our space and rent it to local community organizations that are working in this cultural space. And there was a rental or a space subsidy that wanted to do a forum around black families and obviously, and black love. And so they, we were renting space. And it turned out that it was a organization that was homophobic, that it was pro-heteronormative love and actively oppressing members of our community that were a part of the LGBTQIA plus uh, community. And that was really hard because there were so many folks on the black love side that we totally identified with what their mission was in terms of amplifying um, the family structure of uh, the black family structure, amplifying black love, but it was at the extent of oppressing others. And that was a, a relationship that that had pillars of our community attached to it that we had to disassociate ourselves with because what this conversation is about is setting a table for the equity of our intersectionality. And if we are not having those conversations, then we have turned into the oppressor or the judge and jury of our own community's experience. And we refuse to be that. So um, yeah. I say no to a lot. Well, I think we are at time. So I'm just going to say thank you to everyone here. Thank you again to uh, Sarah and the team at um, the Rubin Foundation, the eighth floor. Um, you all were wonderful. Sarah, do you want to say anything? I'm just going to say good night. I'm just going to say good night too, and thank you all for being here. Um, it's been great to listen and learn from you all. Thank you so much. Thank you.